my friends, welcome back for Gotcha. Come on, my accent wasn't that bad. It definitely wasn't the best. All right, all right. Well, I'm sure you're wondering what that was all about, but I promise you'll find out by the end. Enough of the theories, let's get into the series. This will be the song we're using throughout this demonstration. Now, that was an example with the master bus signal chain on and off. But let's start there, guys. What is a signal chain? And a signal chain in mixing is the path that an audio signal takes from its source to the final output. Basically, it's a series, much like this one, of processing steps that shape and modify the sound of the original source, such as EQ, compression, reverb, delay, and other effects. The signal chain can vary depending on the particular mixing setup and the preferences of the engineer or producer. You know, some engineers prefer to keep things really simple and others have tons of processing on their stuff. It's really just a case by case basis when it comes to these things. But what does that mean for your master bus? Now the master bus signal chain refers to the processing applied to the final stereo mix output. It includes processing steps that help to enhance the overall sound of a mix and prepare it for distribution or for mastering you know, unless you're literally mastering it yourself. And this type of chain includes a combination of EQ, compression, limiting, and other effects that help glue the mix together and create a cohesive sound. Now, the specific processing steps used in the master signal chain varies depending on the mixing engineer's preference and the needs of the project. Just to be clear, the only thing I would always have on my master bus, no matter what, EQ, compression, and limiting. The rest would just be like different things that aren't the bare bone essentials. So the next obvious question here is, how should the order go? People often argue about whether compression should go first or EQ. And I like to think of the master bus as a system of checks and balances, you know? I always put the EQ first because I want the compressor to keep the EQ in check if I do an EQ boost. I'm also increasing the volume of the entire mix. By putting a compressor after that, I'm keeping it in check and smoothing out the boost, but the other way around, I'm compressing the mix and then changing the gain unintentionally, depending on how much I EQ the source. So how should we approach EQing the master bus? Approaching EQ for a master bus requires a delicate touch as any changes made to the overall frequency balance of the mix can have a significant impact on the final sound. Here's some general tips for approaching EQ on your master bus. Uh, once you have a good balance on the master bus, listen for any frequency imbalances that may need to be addressed. This could include boosting or cutting certain frequencies to address problem areas or to enhance the overall tonal balance of the mix. You wanna look for recurring problem areas per genre. You know, in metal, there tends to be low mid buildup around 300 to 500 hertz and a roll off of sub frequencies. And in hip hop songs, sometimes a sub is the main focus and the only point. So let's check the examples that we're using. I feel there's too much low end buildup. So let's just use JST EQ to make this a bit better. If you were loving the way that that EQ sounded on that last example, make sure to go to the description below and get your copy of JST EQ today. And that brings me to my next point. When making EQ adjustments on the master bus, it's generally a good idea to use broad strokes, much like you just saw, rather than making narrow or surgical adjustments. This can help to maintain a natural and transparent sound rather than making the mix sound overly processed or harsh. In this example, a little goes a long way, so be subtle. It's important to be subtle when making EQ adjustments on the master bus, as even small changes can have a significant impact on the overall sound of the mix. Good rule of thumb is to make small adjustments, listen carefully to the effect of each change before making further adjustments. And there's a reason why it's important not to overdo it when it comes to these adjustments. It's really easy to get carried away with processing, but too much EQ can lead to a thin or unnatural sound. Uh, now for the next topic, applying stereo bus compression on a master bus. This is a tool that can help to create a more cohesive and punchy sound for your mix. Here's some general tips for approaching stereo bus compression when it comes to your master bus. 
we're going to start with a low ratio. When setting up your stereo bus compressor, start with a low compression ratio around two to one or three to one and adjust the threshold so the compressor is just touching the loudest parts of the mix. And this is gonna help create more even level across the mix without squashing it too much. Use a slow attack. Using an attack time around 10 to 30 milliseconds allows the initial transients of the mix to pass through without being squashed too much. And this is gonna help maintain the punch and the impact of your mix. Use an auto release when possible. I suggest this as an option for anyone who doesn't truly hear what the compression's doing and wants to just play it safe. For anybody that doesn't wanna play it safe and wants to experiment, use a medium release time, around 50 to 100 milliseconds, to allow the compressor to release between beats, creating a more natural and musical sound. When you're dealing with faster tempos and heavier music though, don't be afraid to use a fast release time, even though it can lead to pumping and some breathing artifacts, you know, the way that it pushes and pulls. Some tools take the thought process out of this for you and have fixed settings so you can focus on other things, but the same principles apply. Let's listen to an example of both of those things. Now, as you saw in that example, monitor the gain reduction. Keep an eye on the meter on your compression to ensure that you're not over compressing the mix. You wanna always aim for around one to three dB at most, especially if you're a beginner. You can take it to four, but you're definitely squashing it and things are happening that you might not be realizing. And avoid using makeup gain. When using stereo bus compression, you might find that the overall level of the mix decreases slightly. So resist the temptation to compensate for this by using makeup gain, because this can lead to distortion and overcompressed sound. Instead, adjust the level of your individual tracks to compensate for any changes in level. And next, we wanna put on our big boy mixing ears. As with any processing on the master bus, it's important to listen critically to the effect of stereo bus compression on the overall sound of the mix. Make sure the compressor is helping to enhance the sound of the mix rather than detract from it. So we went through compression and EQ. Those are the most important parts of the mix, but let's talk about something that only gets used at times in the mix. How to add saturation to your master bus. Saturation's great for adding warmth, character, and harmonics to your mix on your master bus, but we wanna start with a low saturation level and gradually increase it until you achieve the desired result. Because oversaturating your mix can lead to distortion or a muddy sound. And when adding saturation to the master bus, it's important to consider the mix as a whole. Listen to the effect of the saturation on different elements of the mix, such as the drums, bass, and vocals, and adjust the saturation level accordingly. When I do this, I tend to just sprinkle it on because it can get out of hand really easily. I typically go for something like Fab Filter Saturn or DF Excite. I'm gonna use DF Excite for the sake of this example because it only has a few knobs and doesn't make it overly complicated for you to hear what I'm trying to get. Now, notice how much excitement that brought to the mix. And now it's time to add another thing that might or might not get used, a multiband compressor. Now, there's an argument a lot of the time about where a multiband compressor should go, but as an item that I don't always have on my mixing bus, it's hard to answer. The point of adding this is to give you some control over specific areas that your instruments live in, so you don't have to necessarily go change them in the individual tracks, right? Stay in that world of top-down mixing. As a general rule, it's best to place a multiband compressor after any EQ or saturation, but before any final limiting. And here's a few reasons why. Multiband compression is a form of dynamic processing that can help to control the levels of specific frequency bands in your mix. And by placing the multiband compressor after any EQ or saturation processing, you can ensure that the tonal balance of your mix is well established before applying any dynamic processing. By placing the multiband compressor before any final limiting, you can make sure your mix is balanced before the final thing that goes on it. And this can help to prevent artifacts or distortions that may occur when applying heavy limiting. Placing the multiband compressor after an EQ or saturation processing can also help to ensure any changes made by the compressor are applied to the tonal balance of your mix as a whole, rather than affecting specific frequency bands in isolation. This mix wouldn't necessarily benefit from a multiband compressor, but I wanted to give you guys that information regardless. Or here's an example of using a multiband compressor the right way.
And on to the final stage of mastering, how to use a limiter on your master bus. A limiter is a type of processing that is used to control the peak levels of a mix and to prevent clipping. Here are some general tips for using a limiter on your master bus. Place the limiter at the end of your signal chain, always, so that it's the last step before your mix goes out of your speakers or headphones. You're gonna wanna set the ceiling to negative 0.1 dBFS, the ceiling is the level at which the limiter will start to reduce gain. And for a digital mix, it's a good idea to set that ceiling there to prevent any clipping or distortion that may happen. You wanna set the release time appropriately or use auto release. The release time determines how quickly the limiter will release its gain reduction. It's important to set the release time appropriately to ensure that the limiter doesn't negatively impact the dynamics or sound of your mix. A release time of around 50 to 100 milliseconds is a good starting point, and the threshold determines the level at which the limiter is gonna start to reduce that gain. It's important to adjust the threshold to taste based on the dynamic and sound of your mix. Aim for a gain reduction of no more than one to two dB, for a natural and transparent sound. So we're gonna apply these settings with JST Maximizer. Now, we have officially gone over everything needed for a top-down master bus signal chain. Now that you understand how it works, you need to make a template, and the next time you load a session up, mix with these already being applied to your tracks. Is there anything you hope that I'd cover further on this topic of signal chain? Are you ready for the next video? Leave it in the comments below, and I will chat with you fine people, like I always do. If you're an engineer on the come up, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe, you only have to do it one time, and tap that bell for notifications so when a video drops, you know the location. Until next time, my friends, catch you later.